probably have heard the name of Leo Tolstoy. Some consider the greatest of novelists. This Russian writer has a lot of moral force and some helpful things in what he writes. Nevertheless, his writings, his morality was not God-centered, rather it was self-centered. In fact, he, Leo Tolstoy, defined God in his uh, diary, quote, help, Father, come and dwell within me. You already dwell within me. You are already me. Tolstoy once wrote, read a work on the literary characterization of genius today, and this awoke in me the conviction that I am a remarkable man, both as regards capacity and eagerness to work. I have not yet met a single man who was morally as good as I. I do not remember an instance in my life when I was not attracted to what is good and was not ready to sacrifice anything to it. Tolstoy saw himself as a part of an apostolic succession of moral superiors that included the likes of Moses and Isaiah and Confucius and Buddha and Socrates and Jesus and others. Borrowing from the opening words of our text today, we could say that he trusted in himself that he was righteous and he despised others. Luke chapter 18 is our text this morning. I invite you to stand as we read God's Word. Luke chapter 18. I read this very brief, well-known, most loved parable. Luke 18, verse number 9. And he, Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner." I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You may be seated. Just prior to this parable, Jesus gave another parable, and it too was a parable of contrast. And it too was a parable about prayer. And in the first parable, Jesus spoke. He said that men ought always to pray, verse 1, and not to lose heart. He said there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man, nor was, and there was also a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice from me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith? on the earth. And so you have a parable there of contrast. God is so much not like that unjust judge, and you and I are so much not like the widow. We're not destitute. We're not, we're not, when we pray, we're not going to someone who doesn't want to help us. We're not going to someone who doesn't even know our name, who doesn't know us. We're going to a loving Heavenly Father. And so Jesus said, when you pray, pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we're going to a God who loves to show compassion and mercy and grace and forgiveness. And we're going to a God who loves to give us those things. He who spared not his own son, will he not also freely with him give us all things? Romans 8, 32. Parables of contrast. In this parable, too, you have a parable of contrast. 
you have two men, exact polar opposites. One is Mr. Clean, and one is a sleazy tax collector. And Jesus is giving us this parable for a reason. And when he gives us the reason in verse number nine that he gives the parable is he spoke this parable to some. Now, we might say that this is a very broad audience. He gave this parable to any and all who would fall in this category, who trust in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. In this parable, you have contrast, too, of two conceptions of God. Who is God? The God of the Pharisees is a God who has a duty to to him. God owes him because he has abstained from vulgarity. He has kept certain rites and certain forms and certain ceremonies. And because he is morally good and because he is very religious, God has a duty to him. That's the God of the Pharisees. And then there is the God of the publican or the tax collector who believes that God is holy, who believes that he is utterly sinful from the bottom of his feet to the very top of his head, and who believes that he desperately needs mercy from this one who is holy, holy, holy. So the subject today is deadly self-righteousness. This parable that Jesus gives, when we read it, we probably didn't gasp. But trust me, when Jesus gave this parable, many of the people who heard it gasped because it was just another reason to reject him. It was another reason to say, this guy is, is off his rocker. Heaven, we know, is for moral, religious people. And this is an outrageous story that he is saying that this man who is a publican, this man who is not moral, this man who is not religious, walks out of the temple right with God. And the religious man who prayed and who was, who was morally a good person, who maybe even said like Saul of Tarsus, Concerning the law, blameless. Concerning righteousness, a Pharisee. And he leaves church with an intensified alienation from God. This was not the way people saw the doctrine of salvation in that day and time. And trust me, it's not how people see it in our day either. You can walk out on the streets of Lynchburg. You can walk out on the streets of Chicago. You can walk out on the streets of Los Angeles or anywhere you go in this country and around the world and ask people, how do you think people get to heaven? Why do you think you're going to heaven? And what they're going to say is, well, I'm not that bad of a person. I've never killed anyone. I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm a good person. I go to church. I've been baptized. I, I, I. Very few times will you ever ask that question to someone on a street corner and hear them say, I believe I'm going to go to heaven through the mercy and through the shed blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on an old rugged cross. And yet the Bible tells us it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but it is according to his mercy that he saved us. It's not by our works. It is by grace. So the reason for the parable is, is that there were so many that Jesus wanted to speak to who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They had a low view of righteousness And they despised others. I say a low view of righteousness because God has a very high view of righteousness. His standard is the same. It never will change. If you're going to get to heaven by being a good person, how good must one be? Answer, Jesus. Matthew 5.20, he gives us the answer. He says, 
unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says you're not going to make it unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. Here's the standard, chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect. Perfect. Anybody here perfect? I think the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Last time I checked, it's in Romans 3, right? I think the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. So none of us meet this standard. Therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. But that is the divine standard. Absolute perfection. James 2.10 says this. It says, whoever shall keep the whole law. that's, That's a lot. You're not just talking about the Ten Commandments, but we're talking about 600 and some other ordinances under the whole law of God if you keep and let's just talk about the moral law you're talking about hundreds even just the moral law whosoever shall keep the whole law and a stumble in one point he is guilty of all that's James our Lord's brother that's the brother of Jesus that says if you stumble in one point you're guilty of all Listen to Romans chapter 3, verse number 20. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and upon all who believe, for there is no difference. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. God did not give us the law so that we could be saved by it. God gave us the law so that we could see how desperately we need saving. The law, he says, was not made for a righteous man, but for the unrighteous. And so they trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and they despised others. This is what Jesus said about them in chapter 16, verse number 14, if you just flip back a page, 16, 14, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things, and they derided him, they derided Jesus, and he said to them, Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. You justify yourselves before men. Psalm 143, verse number 2 says, In God's sight, no one living is righteous. No one, no one living is righteousness. And they despised others. Do you see that in verse number 9? They despised others. This attitude is seen uh, throughout the Gospels. I just... um, very quickly just kind of ran through the gospel of Luke again the other day just looking for instances that jumped out at me and I'm sure I didn't find them all but I just found some and it's a chapter 5 verse 30 of Luke the, the scribes and the Pharisees complained against Jesus disciples and said why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners Jesus said those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance You have it again in chapter 7 and verse number 29. I found it again when it says all the people that heard him, even the tax collectors, justified God. They were baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, having not been baptized by John. They saw no need of that. Uh, Verse 37, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brings this alabaster flax of fragrant oil, flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her, with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself and said, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. You 
have it again. I found it in the 11th chapter in verse number 37. You have this attitude of disdain towards others. He spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went and he sat down and the Pharisee, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. He went in and sat with him to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees, you make outside the cup clean and the dish clean, but your inward parts full of greed and wickedness, you foolish ones. So again, they're just looking at disdain upon Jesus because he didn't wash before eating. Chapter 13 and verse number 11, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. She was bent over. She couldn't even raise herself up. And Jesus saw her. He called her to him and said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And they said, Jesus, there's six days to work. Not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord said, you hypocrite. Do you not even, do not each of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? Uh, one final place, chapter 15, verse 1. And all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. So there is this matter of they trusted in themselves that they were righteous, but also that they despised others. This maybe describes somebody here today. You really see yourselves as being a good, moral, upright, religious person, and you really have a dislike for other people. So Jesus gives the parable itself. Now let's look at the parable itself in verses 10 through 13. And you have here two men, two postures, two prayers, and two results. You have a Pharisee and a publican. You have two different postures, you have two different prayers, and you have two different results of their prayers. The two men, Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray. That's what the temple's for. That's why you go there. You go there to worship. You go there to pray. You go there to give. You go there to encourage and teach and preach. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Now, there are two times they went to pray every day, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. You guessed it, the 3 p.m. service was better attended than the 9 a.m. service. They were Baptists back in those days too. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Now we've been talking about these tax collectors for weeks and weeks and weeks. This is my 12th sermon on some of Jesus' sermons in the Gospel of Luke. And many of them have had to do with tax collectors. Despised, looked down upon, traitors of their country, collecting taxes for the Romans, stealing off of the top, skimming off the top, doing for themselves and boosting their own, their own um, economy at the advantage of the poor. And so you have these two men, Pharisees, tax collectors. You have these two types of people in every church. Every church has these two types of people, polar opposites. Cain Abel, wheat, tares, Pharisee, publican, one religious, one, he's morally religious, verse 11, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, I don't, I, I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm certainly not like this tax collector. Not only is he moral, not only can he give the negative illustration of I don't do these things, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls that do. But I can give a positive illustration about what I do and that is I am a very religious man. Verse number 12, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Then on the other opposite polar end, you've got this low life a term we would use today, scumbag. A, a most despised man. Two men. Two. Which best describes you? And I know I didn't paint a 
pretty picture for the publican, but it's going to get better for him. Because look at the two postures. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He really doesn't offer a prayer. He offers a soliloquy. He offers a self-congratulatory prayer. He doesn't ask God for anything. He, he never says, God, I need mercy. He never says, God, I need forgiveness. He never gives, gives God worship. He's, he does say, I thank you, but then it's in a self-congratulatory sense. I thank you that I'm not like other people are. I thank you that you've kept me from the vulgarities of this world. One is there to make an appearance. One is there to make a request. Hello, why did you come to church today? One is there to make an appearance. One is there to make a request. I desperately need God. I'm not who I want to be. I want to be different. I need to be changed. I need to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need God's forgiveness. I need encouragement. And some, like this Pharisee, are there to make an appearance. We know this man is full of humility, this publican, because of his location. Verse 13, he's standing afar off. His posture, he could not so much as raise his eyes to heaven because that's the way you would pray. You would lift up your hands. You would raise your eyes to heaven. And no doubt the Pharisee was doing that. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. This publican couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. The Pharisee was as close to the altar as he could get. The publican is as far away as he can get. He feels he's so unworthy. I cannot even get into the presence of holy God. And he does something else, his behavior. The Bible says there in verse number 13 that he beat his chest. I only find one other time in the New Testament where this takes place, and it is very interesting where it takes place. In chapter 23 and verse number 48, the Bible says this. There at Golgotha, there at Mount Calvary, Jesus is hanging on a cross, and the whole crowd came together to that site, seeing what had been done. Beat their breast. It took the agony of Golgotha. It took the cross it took divinity, deity, hanging from a tree saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And for men to stand around, and men and women, it was really a woman thing to do. It's what they did at funerals. They still do it today in Middle Eastern culture. It's still a part of their culture. But this man beat his chest out of extreme anguish. And then his words, God, be merciful to me. A sinner, better translated because of the, there's a definite article in the Greek New Testament, the sinner. I'm not just a sinner, I'm the sinner, I'm the worst sinner I know. And every person in here ought to really be able to say that because no one knows you as well as you know yourself and you ought to know you are the worst sinner you know in all the world. Two postures, two prayers. How, how unlike one another are they? Watch, in one, in two verses, he uses the personal pronoun I five times. I thank you. That I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. It is a self-congratulatory prayer. He doesn't say, I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not like this tax collector. By the grace of God. He doesn't give God any glory and any praise for that. He seeks no mercy, seeks no grace, seeks no forgiveness, congratulates himself for being the wonderful person that he is. 
Someone said it this way, two men went to pray, or rather say one went to brag, the other to pray. One stands up close and treads on high, where the other dare not send his eye. One nearer to the altar trod, the other to the altar's God. And here's the two results. Verse number 14. I tell you, this man, that is the publican, that is the despised man, that is the hated man, that is the man who's not moral and the man who is not religious, he went down to his house, say it church, justified. That word means to be right with God. Always meant that, always has, always will. It's even used way back in the Old Testament. Job asked the question, how can a man be justified? How can a man be right with God? Greatest question that could ever be asked. So like Acts 16. What must I do to be saved? How can I get to heaven? How can I be right with God? How can I have my sins forgiven? Jesus said the publican went down to his house, saved, redeemed, on his way to heaven. The Pharisee didn't. Rather than the other. And then Jesus gives this closing maxim, this truism that we talked about last Sunday. Everyone... Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And you could also say everyone or he who humbles himself will be exalted. Another way Jesus could put it was, if you want to go to heaven, you must humble yourself. If you exalt yourself, if you're proud like this Pharisee, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. There's no salvation apart from repentance. There's no salvation apart from a broken heart and a contrite spirit which God will not despise. So I ask you this morning, are you forgiven? Have you been cleared of all charges? Can you say with the psalmist when he said, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Can you say, that describes me? Can you say with the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It was Isaiah the prophet who said, I, even I, am he. God says through his prophet, I am he who blots out your transgressions. I will not remember your sins. He says over in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 22, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Micah chapter 7 verse 18, who is a God like you pardoning iniquity? He doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's the God I serve. That's the God of the Bible. Loving, gracious, forgiving God to any and all who will humble themselves. It's not the religious who get to heaven. It's not the moral who get to heaven. It is those who bow the knee and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I wonder if you've ever done that. I wonder if you have ever done that. Prayer, religiosity, denominationalism, it won't get us there. Jesus said this, and I close with this thought, just one more thought to try to tie it all in to help you to see that this is biblical truth that I'm sharing with you. The rich young ruler. You remember the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, good master, he said, 
Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit, inherit eternal life? How can I have heaven? How can I have eternal life? Jesus said, no one is good but God. He said, he said keep the commandments. He said, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, all these I've kept from my youth up. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man, young man heard that, he, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples heard it and they were greatly astonished and they said this question, who then can be saved? If it's not through being a good person and this guy, you talk about good, man, he's done, he's done kept the law like nobody's else. Who's, who can be saved? Who can go to heaven? See how Jesus is just trying to teach them all along through these parables and through these lessons that you need to be forgiven. You need to be cleared of all charges. And you could be instantly made perfect. You can leave justified if you bow the knee to Jesus and confess that he's Lord and confess that you're a sinner and stop trying to work your way to heaven. Lord, look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. That's what Job 40, verse number 12 said. To be exalted means salvation and to be humbled means eternal judgment. Let's pray together. Father, I have preached to a broad audience this morning too. And you know every heart. And you know those who are wheat and those who are tares. You know those who are canes and those who are ables. And you know those who are like the Pharisee and those who are like the publican. You know those who feel they have no need of salvation because they're so good. And you have those who like this publican recognize how sinful they are and how much they need God's mercy and how much they need Jesus. And I thank you that you're a God that saves those who are willing to humble themselves, repent, turn from their sin, and turn to Christ. So in this moment of invitation, I pray that many, some, one, would do that. There's, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, who does that. So may it be that this morning. Exalt those who humble themselves. Save those who do that. I know you will. You promised you will. It's in your name, Lord, we pray. Amen.